here <laughs> ask you long quiz as I know. Thank you again. Uh, we are 10 minutes behind. Uh, I give the speech to the next panel, Christos Papastilianos. Professor Papastilianos is um, professor, professor of law at the University of Nicosia Cyprus uh, Law School, and he will um, uh, chair the first panel. Um, uh, so goodbye for now from me, uh, Christos. Thank you, Akritas. Uh, uh, hello to everybody. I would like to welcome you uh, in the first session of uh, the Conference on Populist Tran Transformation of Constitutional Law. It is an introductory session, introductory in the sense that uh, all four presentations focus on uh, and clarify uh, some key concepts uh, which are linked uh, to constitutional populism. But sometimes they are used in public discourse in a very confusing way. And I would like also to repeat that uh, everyone who is interested in can raise a question through a chat or orally if he is uh, or she is a uh, speaker of the conference. And uh, the first uh, speaker in this session is Professor Gabor Hal uh, Halmai. Uh, dear Gabor, uh, your floor, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for this, this uh, uh, kind uh, invitation and possibility to, to share my views, which will be very similar to that of, of Boyan, but uh, claiming some originality for myself as well. I have to, to uh, refer to our joint, uh, jointly edited uh, special if issue of the, of the German Law Journal back in 2019, where we, we both represented uh, uh, very, very similar uh, uh, viewpoints about populism and constitutionalism, which I'm going to present now after, after sharing my, my Prezi presentation. Uh, I hope you, you can see the presentation now. Yeah, uh, I can see. And he, here is the overview. Here is the overview of my, my short intervention. Uh, of course, uh, certain overlaps with, with the topics of, of Boyan's excellent keynote speech is, is unavoidable. Uh, so, uh, I also start with the varieties of, of populism, uh, the, the usual uh, uh, categorization of, of left and right wing populism here, uh, all the, all the uh, actually actors uh, mentioned by, by uh, Boyan are uh, listed here as well. I, I do not want to go into the details uh, of, of these categorization. My, my main uh, conclusion, you can see at the very last uh, line, uh, namely that it seems to me that, that the left and, and the right uh, kind of uh, differentiation of populism does not really help to understand uh, the various uh, 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 approaches to populism, uh, mostly because their relationship to, to uh, constitutionalism. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, both in, in the left and, uh, and in the right, we can find uh, populists who do accept constitutionalism and, and uh, some who do not accept. In other words, we, we cannot just claim that right-wing populists uh, 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 are enemies of constitutionalism, while left-wing populists are always friends of, of constitutionalism. Uh, let me mention also uh, only uh, uh, Venezuela, uh, both uh, uh, Maduro and, and his predecessor as 
as certainly enemies of, of, of constitutional thinking. Let me move to the second slide. Uh, what can be a, a more constructive uh, way to define populism for our purposes, especially uh, for the purposes to, to connect populism with constitutionalism. And here I, I use uh, a differentiation used by Isaiah Berlin in a presentation uh, in 1967 at, at a conference uh, in LSE. Uh, Berlin uh, actually differentiated between uh, the real and false uh, populist, saying that all those, uh, and this very much uh, 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 similar to the, to the, to the uh, word used masquerading, he, he was saying that actually some populists only use populism as a rhetorical uh, tool. Uh, and I very much agree with, with here with, with Boyan that, that all those uh, current uh, autocrats, uh, uh, starting with, with uh, my own prime minister, meaning uh, uh, the prime minister of my home country, Hungary, Viktor Orban, who is very much using the populist rhetoric, even though if you, if you look at the substance of, of uh, Orban's and Fidesz's uh, politics is, is anything but, but uh, real uh, uh, populism uh, in the sense using direct democracy, using anti-representative rep rhetoric or using uh, as, as certain, certain uh, uh, real populist use uh, anti-egalitarian uh, 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 claims or anti-egalitarian uh, policies. Actually, uh, Viktor Orban's Fidesz party uh, produced uh, the, the largest income in inequality in the last 10 years uh, uh, in Hungary, uh, ever since the democratic uh, uh, transition. Again, I do not go uh, through all these, these possible uh, definitions, partly mentioned by, by Boyan's presentation, starting with, with Jan Werner Müller, my former Princeton colleague, whom I really ad admire, but I agree with Boyan that, that uh, uh, Jan's definition is based on the anti-pluralist uh, uh, characteristic of, of populism, which does not apply to, to a lot of so-called real uh, uh, populist uh, characterized by, by Berlin. Uh, here you, you can see also my colleague who will follow me, uh, Paul Blocker, who was the other co-editor of the mentioned uh, German law uh, review uh, article or, or, or special issue, and he will also uh, have the, the uh, opportunity to, to talk about his own uh, uh, approach. So let me go further and, and uh, talking about this already mentioned uh, authoritarian uh, populist uh, rhetoric. Uh, I already devoted some time to, to Viktor Orban uh, about uh, anti-representation. Uh, actually, Viktor Orban is the main beneficiary of the, of the parliamentary representative system uh, with, with the two-third majority in the last 11 years uh, being able to to uh, enact uh, a new constitution for Hungary and an illiberal constitution proudly announced uh, without any, any uh, contribution to, to opposition parties. So what it is, if, if it's not using representation and not anti-representation, the same way Viktor Orban was the first to change the rules of the, of the referendum, making it almost impossible to challenge any governmental 
measures by by referendum. So what it is, if it's not not uh, uh, something which is substantively anti-populist. Uh, 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 here, very very briefly, uh, let let me mention uh, uh, the the issue which which was also raised by my my friend uh, Wojciech Sadurski in the Q&A uh, of the Boyan's presentation. What, what is the distinction between the non-populist autocrats and the, 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 the populist autocrats? Populist autocrats are coming uh, to power through democratic elections, which is certainly was not the case or still not the case by by some uh, uh, non-populist uh, autocrats like like uh, Lukashenko in 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 Belarus, uh, at least uh, part of the of this this coming to power of of populist autocrats also in Hungary uh, was due to a democratic election. At least the very first election was democratic in in Hungary back in 2010. The subsequent two elections were were less democratic and certainly. Uh, uh, less fair. Uh, I do not want to go into the details of, of whom to blame uh, for, for this kind of uh, authoritarian uh, populism. I could mention here one, one aspect of, of this, this issue, namely uh, my former EUI colleague uh, Joseph Weiler's uh, uh, piece uh, published recently saying that actually we, we should not really uh, uh, criticize or blame this kind of populist autocrats like Viktor Orban, he mentioned explicitly Orban, because they were elected by the, by the people. So what's wrong with, with the people's choice of, of populist uh, autocrats? There are a lot of lot of problems with that. Besides the non-democratic election system, also the the non-existent uh, 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 freedom of the media, which makes this this population electing the autocrat uh, 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 non-informed uh, uh, voter population. Uh, let me. Let me go very, very quickly uh, to the point uh, which, which I want to make to differentiate this kind of, of uh, autocratic populism from, uh, from political constitutionalism. Uh, of those mentioned in, in the slide who argue, including uh, Boyan's co-author Mark Tashnet, argue for a weaker uh, type of or kind of judicial review. Autocratic populism has nothing to do with that uh, because they do not acknowledge an independent uh, judicial review at all. They pack constitutional courts as happened not only in Hungary, but in, in Poland uh, uh, as well. And this kind of, of uh, Populism, populist auto, uh, authoritarianism also has nothing to do with the popular uh, constitutionalism of the Swiss direct democracy or the Icelandic or Irish uh, direct or, or, or uh, more uh, popular uh, constitution uh, making uh, procedure. And let me conclude uh, uh, my short presentation by by saying, which is very similar to the claims of, of Boyan, whether there is such a thing as populist uh, constitutionalism, it very much defends, depends on the definition of both populism uh, and constitutionalism. Uh, populism, which is critical towards uh, the oligarchic uh, uh, elite, as Boyan uh, uh, characterizes the democratic uh, populism, which is not anti-pluralist, as Jan Werner Müller claims, is certainly uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, 
uh, line with with constitutionalist uh, ideas, why those who are who are uh, against any kind of of checks and balances, separation of powers, uh, using populist uh, democrats are certainly not. In other words, those false populists cannot be called as as constitutionalist. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Christo, you need to, okay. Uh, Gabor, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, now we are uh, going to proceed uh, with the next speaker, uh, Professor Paul Blocker. And uh, Paul, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm really happy to be part of this panel and of this conference. Um, I'm not entirely sure if I can live up to some of the claims that were uh, put onto the speakers before bringing clarity. Uh, actually, looking at my slides, I thought there were some things missing. So I will do my best. Um, I'm going to share uh, my slides. Okay. Um, are they visible? I hope so. Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, so um, my argument is basically going to uh, look at the uh, relation between uh, populism and constitutionalism from a larger, uh, longer term historical perspective. Um, so I try to understand uh, whether we can see populism in one way or the other as a, a, a reaction uh, and as a critique to what one could call a post-war, and I mean post-Second uh, World War, uh, order. Um, and I would like to use a larger term, I will come back to that at the very end, um, uh, an imaginary uh, of constitutions and of constitutionalism as such. So uh, my argument will be basically, um, um, uh, I start with a, a very brief sort of depiction of what I think this post-war constitutionalism looks like. Uh, and then I will try to uh, depict a, uh, a reaction in the form of populist constitutionalism. Um, and that was exactly what I was thinking about just before uh, I was giving, uh, given the screen. That is, most of the things I'm going to say refer to uh, right-wing populism, uh, what I also uh, would like to call, at least in many of its manifestations, a conservative form uh, of populism. And uh, the left-wing versions, uh, they, they will come back at the very end, but they're a bit tricky, I have to admit. And particularly after the excellent talk of Boyan, of course, we can't ignore uh, this variety. Um, but that's what I, perhaps in some way, I can sort of find some solutions to that by in my third part, and that is about indeed a populist imaginary, uh, in particular also a populist uh, constitutional imaginary. So starting um, uh, with um, uh, what I tend to call post-war embedded constitutionalism, I think it's extremely important if you want to understand uh, the relation between populism and constitutionalism in the current epoch, uh, we need to go back to the construction um, and also in a wider sense, the imagination of what, a, what modern constitutionalism means and means to us and means to various actors. Uh, in current times. Um, and it seems to me that uh, the original uh, setup, even if the historical uh, story is much more messy than my very uh, simplified version here, but the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of birth of post-war constitutionalism is one that I would want to call anti-totalitarian. So its main mission is uh, to be in strong contrast with the totalitarian experiences. And that means a, uh, a view of constitutionalism largely as a negative device, uh, as a limiting power type of device, which feeds through into ideas of divisions of power, et cetera. Um, it also feeds through in a way, uh, in an understanding, in a language of fundamental 
human rights, um, and a view of, uh, of democracy as ultimately grounded in a protection uh, by uh, judicial institutions, in particular, of course, uh, apex courts, uh, in many cases, constitutional courts. Um, and the, 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 the other side of the coin in, in a certain way is then that um, democratic, constitutional democratic systems uh, show some kind of imbalance. That is, they're geared towards control, protection uh, by judicial and other institutions, the side of a kind of literalistic democratic understanding of democracy. That is, uh, people uh, give themselves their government, their power, their laws, etc. Participation by citizens, more particularly, uh, is very limited in this view. And uh, well, um, this relates then to a, a view of. Uh, um, Oh, here actually the title is wrong, and I apologize for that. But uh, the view of uh, post war modern constitutionalism is then indeed in a kind of hierarchical sense. And in many ways, constitutional law, uh, human rights are seen as something that is outside of society and of, uh, outside of politics in a more limited sense. So you get a kind of hierarchical Kelsian understanding. Uh, of what constitutionalism is, how it functions, how it operates. But at the same time, and this is, I think, very interesting, it's part of a larger um, um, scheme of things. And this is particularly evident, of course, uh, with regard to the European context, which with, with which I'm most familiar, where there's a, a, a strong uh, um, international, interdependent, entangled system that is in the making uh, from the 1950s onwards. And this cannot be left out of, outside of the picture. This is extremely important because it defines the identity of post-war modern constitutionalism. And that's why I call it a kind of embedded constitutionalism uh, if one focuses on the domestic context. An important side to that is also that law and constitutional law in important respects is understood as universalistic, as pertaining to some kind of more broader, let's say, uh, political legal language for humanity as such. Um, and this, I think, is important to depict it like this. Um, I, I, I'm clearly not the only one thinking along these lines, looking at post-war constitutionalism. This is a bit small uh, uh, and a, a bit crowded, this slide. Uh, but basically, I'm looking here at a couple of texts that make, in some ways, similar arguments. Jan Wenne Müller, who has already been mentioned, his uh, Contesting Democracy book, where he talks indeed about post-war constrained democracy um, with a strong uh, emphasis on, on strong judicial institutions and limited influence from citizens. Uh, there's the book by uh, uh, Jorfi on uh, uh, Against the New Constitutionalism, where equally this sort of picture of uh, uh, post-war constitutionalism is uh, um, uh, uh, fleshed out. Uh, and there's another recent book that talks more about human rights uh, and the human rights imaginary, which is equally, uh, in some ways, completely novel uh, from the 1950s onwards, in particular from the 1970s onwards, corrob corroborating in a way uh, my argument about this sort of embedded understanding of constitutionalism with a lot larger framework of international judicial institutions like uh, the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and then actually the most interesting, I feel, um, contribution to this debate is someone uh, who I knew uh, for longer, but whose work I've been looking at more closely only more recently, and that is Marcel uh, Gaucher, a uh, French uh, sociologist who actually argues in a much more profound sense, I think, uh, that the particular type of democracy that has emerged um, in the post-war period, and particularly from the 1970s onwards, is a kind of what he calls legal democracy or a juridical idea of democracy where human rights take uh, the lead. Um, and a particular view of human rights, I don't have time to expand on this right now, uh, but what is profound in his argument is that in many ways, the ways in which um, uh, post-war constitutional democracy based on human rights develops, undermines 
collective political projects. And it's uh, links to his uh, deeper argument about expanding individualization in our modern societies. Uh, we don't need to go into details here, but the important part of the story is that in my view, uh, in particular in right-wing manifestations of right-wing populism, um, this post-war embedded constitutional democratic uh, design and form of society is a very important component of the populist critique. Um, so I've called it in various ways, uh, critique of liberal legalism, uh, forms of legal resentment, as I've called it in the past. And what strikes me, and that uh, I noticed recently in a couple of research projects, where I try to link um, uh, um, the types of populism I've been more engaging with in Central and Eastern Europe, with actual Western European manifestations of populism. And you see in a way, at least that's my uh, conclusion, across the board in forms of right-wing populism, similar types of critique on understandings of law and understandings of constitutionalism, in particular also on understandings of international entanglement. Uh, and so uh, a common thread is clearly also a critique on international courts, in particular, um, the European Court of Human Rights as, uh, as a problematic institution. So here on the right, you see a recent intervention by a Dutch uh, um, right-wing populist party, uh, Forum for Democracy, Thierry Baudet is its main exponent, um, in the recent Dutch elections, where he argues against uh, what he calls dicastocracy, uh, uh, ju uh, juristocracy, whatever you want to call it, against indeed uh, too uh, strong influence uh, of uh, and power of judicial institutions. Um, and as I said, I think you see this across the board, a peculiar relationship, or in some ways actually a, a pretty straightforward relationship to what constitutions are uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, should not be. Um, and I link this to a larger uh, particular strand of conservatism. So one could actually um, blow this up into a much more profound critique, I think, of enlightenment thinking, of enlightenment rationality, I would like to call it, um, which is grounded in ideas of progress, uh, malleability of society, uh, controllability, measurability, calculability of social relations, um, um, and the conservative critique is that that, that view of society, uh, a, a rational scientific view of society in a way, undermines traditional views. Um, so this is very much grounded in a way in the um, enlightenment versus romanticism uh, uh, distinction, let's say in modernity. Um, to put it in more simple terms then, the conservative view comes then to the fore in a critique of a legalistic scientific view uh, of society and of the making of society. And it ultimately, even if sometimes very implicitly, it points to a very different understanding of a perfect society, a harmonious hierarchical conservatively understood society. And it seems to me that a lot of the critique on post-war modern constitutionalism then uh, takes a critique of that rationalistic understanding uh, of modern constitutionalism as a, a, a rational technique of harmonizing society, of pacifying society. Um, and so, well, you see here a couple of examples. Uh, there's uh, Richard Legutko, who's an influential figure, of course, in law and justice and also on the European scene, uh, who criticizes in many ways liberal understandings of constitutionalism and, and human rights and law. On the right side, Paolo Becchi, who's a, one could say, in sort of organic intellectual, first of the Five Star Movement, now much closer to the Lega, um, who has written recently a, a sovereignist manifesto where he actually indeed portrays a very different view of, of rights. In his case, he, he actually uh, fleshes out a charter of rights of peoples rather than human rights. Uh, so again, a kind of different uh, view of what law and what constitutions are. Uh, Thierry Baudet's work on defending the nation state. And then on the right side, Alternative für Deutschland and Germany, 
who recently in particular very outspokenly presents itself as the defender uh, of the German basic law, also in the name of a critique indeed of international uh, interference into German um, uh, democracy. Um, and so, well, th the main thrust then of my argument is that one way of understanding, and in my view, an essential way of understanding right-wing populism, at least in the European context, is this, this critique of this liberal legalism um, and what is seen as an increased diffusion of liberal le legalism in relation indeed to uh, modern constitutionalism um, as a kind of attempt to uh, push it back. Uh, and in some ways then perhaps backlash does make sense uh, as a term, even if I'm not uh, extremely fond of it. Um, but brings me indeed to the final part then. Um, it seems to me that in that critique, a kind of conservative right-wing populist critique of liberal understandings of modern constitutionalism, there is a broader um, and in a way deeper uh, imaginary that relates to what constitutions are uh, and what the law is. Um, and there I related to indeed, and there are quite some colleagues now that have taken, up, have taken this road as well. Uh, I relate to understandings of social imaginaries uh, but particularly also constitutional and legal imaginaries, um, which one could say in modern times relate to two deeper notions um, of how to understand uh, societal orders. One of them indeed is mastery, and I'm relating here to the Greek, French Greek scholar Cornelius Castoriadis in his work on social imaginaries. One of them is mastery, and the other one is autonomy. And in a second, I will relate that more clearly to constitutionalism, where we can already think about it in terms of, on the one hand, mastery as a form of control, as a form of fabrication, as a form of engineering society, autonomy as a kind of form of creativity, um, radicality perhaps even, uh, and non-domination. Um, and this is what I've been, uh, um, thinking about now for a long time but this morning i became uh, creative so i turned it i hope you can see it in one way or the other uh, my sort of mapping here of different types of constitutions uh, of constitutionalisms um, where i try to uh, uh, visualize different imaginaries um, uh, a general uh, imaginary of modern constitutionalism which should be related to the last two more than two centuries, where post-war embedded constitutionalism takes a kind of, in some ways, unbalanced um, uh, road where the emphasis is indeed on mastery, is on constitutional engineering, to use a term of uh, Sartori, um, is on uh, all those matters that I, I, I developed already in the earlier part of my uh, uh, um, presentation. Um, but of course, there are other forms of constitutionalism around under the banner of modern constitutionalism, uh, as we know very well, particularly in, in theoretical terms, uh, or at least theoretical debates, political constitutionalism, which is in some ways less unbalanced because it puts less emphasis on the judicial side. It allows more room for democratic politics, so it should perhaps be placed more in the middle. And then on the right side, indeed, a populist uh, interpretation of constitutionalism, where in some cases uh, there's a more radical emphasis on um, popular sovereignty, emancipation, in a way, the civic voice, uh, which might lead to uh, change in creativity. I, I put the line between uh, uh, modern constitutionalism, autonomy, and populist constitutionalism in interrupted sense, because I feel in some ways, at least some forms of right-wing populist constitutionalism have a fairly uh, limited uh, take on that notion of uh, populist, uh, of, of popular sovereignty. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, my argument, or at least my hunch is that we might be living in times, at least in the last 10 years or so, perhaps even longer indeed, where we see a shift from a post-war dominance of 
a kind of indeed liberal legal constitutional uh, imaginary to a populist imaginary, or at least the populist legal imaginary is becoming, um, uh, is diffusing and is becoming more prominent in various quarters, it seems to me. It criticizes the universalism, the internationalism, and in some way, um, you might call it the no uh, monism uh, of the post-war uh, constitutional uh, understanding of constitutionalism. Um, and to try that, to, to, to flesh that out further, we don't have much time now, perhaps, but you might see that on different levels. Um, it might be uh, visible, for instance, in the way uh, populists, right-wing populists relate to the level of the polity, criticizing the liberal constitutionalism, actually changing uh, existing liberal constitutions in different ways, um, emphasizing majoritarianism, uh, claiming that their new populist order is more deeply grounded in the people. Um, but you also see it in different forms of policies, trying to roll back certain types of human rights, for instance. Let's think about recent developments in Poland about abortion law, etc. And also in politics itself, you see certain ways in which uh, this uh, uh, liberal legal constitutional view of society is being in very way, various ways countered. Uh, by the right-wing uh, populist politics. Um, this brings me to my final slide. And again, uh, I'm not sure how much clarity uh, I am able to create here because it seems to me that the picture is actually pretty complex. Uh, and that's why I, I appreciate very much uh, Bojan's and Mark's uh, book, which um, at least bits and pieces I've had the privilege to have a look at. Um, where indeed they make a claim there are varieties, there are many faces of populism. Um, and so in the populist constitutionalism dimension, um, we need to uh, distinguish, we need to find indeed different ways in which this populist imaginary is being flashed out. The first one here in the middle is a direct critique of this legalistic understanding, liberal understanding of constitutionalism, international understanding, internationalist understanding of constitutionalism. It criticizes indeed um, uh, um, um, the interdependent nature. It puts sovereignism again uh, uh, to the fore, uh, a kind of isolationist view to the do domestic, the position of the domestic polity. Um, great critique of liberalism in many ways, uh, of liberal pluralism, but there are also other um, forms of populist constitutionalism. And particularly if we go to the left-wing versions, um, not least as uh, Bojan indicated and others, um, in cases of Syriza, Podemos, but also on the European level, for instance, with uh, DM25, which I think is in some ways relevant, we see a different relation uh, to populist constitutionalism. There, it's not necessarily uh, the majority or what Urbinati has called a for, uh, as a form of extreme majoritarianism, but it's actually citizens. It's actually society. It's actually individuals as in society that are put into the, the seat of sovereignty. Um, and so a dominant form is, uh, of power is not neither the judicial nor the executive or the majority, it's society. And it's society in some, many of these cases on the suit in a pluralistic sense. Um, and so uh, we see there uh, different ways of, um, let's say the positive dimensions uh, that come after the larger popul populist critique of liberal, liberal legalism uh, and post-war uh, understandings of, of liberal, um, universalistic uh, constitutionalism. So um, that is basically what I'm trying to argue. So that we uh, need to put uh, in a priority position in our analysis of the relation between populism and constitutionalism, this type of reaction to the post-war order, which can then indeed play out in different ways. And in the right-wing conservative one, it's definitely um, 
a kind of closure into uh, a nationalistic uh, sovereignist understanding, but that's not uh, the only story. And I will uh, stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, I think that uh, we still have time to conclude uh, uh, the next two presentations within uh, the time, uh, within time. And uh, now let's proceed to the third presentation. Uh, Valerio, the floor yeah. is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the organizers, for having invited me in this very interesting and brilliant and uh, conference. I'm really, really honored to be to be here and to present my my reflections about populism and in relationship with democratic theory and constitutionalism. Um, I, I'm afraid I will I will have some overlapping with uh, with the speeches that are previous than me and. Uh, but I hope to 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 keep my my argument in uh, in an original vein. I will not present a PowerPoint, so I will follow my 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 text, my 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 paper, and I will I will skip something from the paper you have received uh, from the from the organizers. But but I think I I, I will try to not not left. Uh, aside uh, important points. So um, my 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 presentation, my argument will be will be mm, divided into two great two big um, ways. For in the first part, I will I will try to 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 investigate populism from a purely political theoretical uh, standpoint. So, so as to, to try to, to, to provide um, some uh, political um, uh, sketches about this phenomena. And the last, in the second part of my, of my speech, I will try to, to, to draw my arguments uh, for the relationship within, with, with constitutionalism and, and populism, and to try to understand how populism affect constitutional democracy. Uh, first of all, uh, what is populism in a political, as a political concept? Um, much of the, of the theorists that have uh, discussed populism, uh, in, my, in my opinion, has uh, shared the, the idea that populism is a, is a very difficult uh, phenomenon to be uh, to be spelled out, to be um, described described in a systematic way, and we we, we can we can find a very uh, different and uh, interesting uh, arguments and definitions of such a phenomena. I I sum up some uh, some of the most important. Um, Um, first of all, I, someone, I, I think, to, for, for example, Camille Ungureano has defined populism as a catch-all concept to, to testify the complexity of the, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, populist uh, phenomenon. Uh, other, other theorists has pointed out that populism is not uh, an anti-democratic uh, phenomena as such, but rather as mm -hmm. a, they have defined populism as a anti-liberal or unliberal uh, concept. Uh, let's think, for example, uh, Professor Alessandro Ferrara has recently defined uh, populism as a majoritarian post-liberalism arguing that it is naive and inappropriate to identify populism as a mere anti-democratic pathology. By contrast, he says, populists do not contest democracy as such, but they openly are against liberalism, political liberalism. Uh, Kasmude, uh, moreover, has stressed that populism uh, 
uses some of the uh, democratic strategies such as majoritarianism and uh, majority rule to, to take decisions by refusing at the same time some of the uh, liberal conceptions such as check and balances, judicial, judicial supremacy, um, pluralism, uh, uh, multiculturalism and so on. Uh, so uh, we can define, we can also define uh, populism as a, as a form of pseudo democratic uh, system that uh, embodies some of the uh, most democratic, most democratic um, contents, but, but uh, refuse some others that holds to, to the uh, liberal conception of, the, uh, of democracy. Traditionally, um, my, my previous colleagues has just uh, pointed out this, uh, this differentiation. Uh, commonly, uh, we, we can define uh, left-wing and right-wing uh, approaches to, to populism. And uh, to summarize, uh, briefly summarize this, this, this differentiation, right-wing populism pursues nationalistic issues, it aims at defending the people from an ethnic, conservative and traditional um, position. Uh, and they, their recall to the people, the real people, the pure people, is uh, often um, based on nationalistic and ethnic uh, reasons. Uh, commonly, right-wing populism repudiates multiculturalism and pluralism in a liberal sense by promoting differentiation, discrimination in some senses, and exclusion and uh, accusing minorities, uh, for example, migrants or uh, minoritarian uh, categories to be the, a threat, a threat for the pure people, the nationalistic people. Uh, sometimes right-wing populism has also a, concedes with a charismatic conception of the leadership. Let's see, let's think, for example, the charismatic vision of the president uh, that transpired by uh, President Trump or Orban in Hungary or, uh, or Erdogan in Turkey or Bolsonaro in, in, um, in Brazil. So uh, right-wing populism seemed to uh, share the same, the same leaderistic and charismatic uh, idea of power, of, of sovereignty, of leadership. Um, by contrast, I will, I will be, um, I'm going to be fast on this point. By contrast, left-wing populism does not entail nationalistic or ethnocentric uh, perspectives uh, with much and left-wing populists are much less racial. They are not interested in racial or ethnic discrimination uh, because the real enemy of of populist of leftist populists are the privileged castes, the financial markets, supranational economic and financial institutions, and so on. So uh, leftists are not illiberal as uh, rightist uh, populists are, and th their battles are not against uh, multiculturalism or, or um, pluralism, but against austerity. Uh, we have seen during the, the economic crisis, uh, leftist populist forces and leaders, leaders to, to, um, to fight against um, austerity, uh, inequalities also, lack of solidarities, imperialism uh, in, a, in some sense. Let's think, for example, uh, leftist populist uh, governments in South America, uh, or also the lobbyist powers. Bernie Sanders' US presidential primary campaign uh, has, has been focused 
on fighting lobbies and uh, privileges, privileged castes. Uh, in uh, one of the most uh, important and, and uh, relevant contributions in this way has been provided by Chantal Mouffe in, a, in her uh, recent book for a, Left, for a Left Populism. And in this book, she uh, eloquently drawn a neat distinction between right-wing and left-wing approaches to populism by defending the leftist claim to populism as the most reasonable way to defend the people against elite, elites and hegemonic powers. The main differences between right-wing and left-wing populism, according to, to Mouffe, lies in the concept of sovereignty, where the right, rightist populist, sovereignty implies nationalism and ethnicity. Right-wing populist Mouffe poses, I quote her, do not address the demand for equality and they construct a people that excludes numerous categories, usually immigrants, seen as the, a threat to the identity and the prosperity of the nation. By contrast, left-wing populism defends a concept of sovereignty we may, might, might call democratic or participatory, uh, surely uh, agonistic. Uh, Chantal Mouffe is famous for for having um, proposed uh, an agonistic uh, approach to democracy. Now I close. I, I close this this very brief conceptual and political uh, distinction of populism, and I will I will focus in my in my conclusive uh, section to the relationship between con uh, constitutionalism and and populism. By I, I will I, I will I will say that um, traditionally uh, uh, we, we can find three different and in some sense uh, opposite approaches to constitutionalism, opposite to legal liberal constitutionalism, a la John Rawls, for ex for instance, or uh, um, Frank Michaelman, or also or also Bruce Ackerman, and so on. Um, and populist constitutionalism is one of the most the most radical way to critique and to and to reject legal judicial democracy. And uh, it, it, it has been said uh, previously uh, before me, uh, populist, popular, and uh, political constitutionalisms that are th the three main foes of of legal constitutionalism or li liberal democratic constitutionalism present similarities, but also very different uh, aspects. Uh, I will focus uh, on briefly on these three uh, approaches. Uh, first, uh, first point, uh, populist and, and uh, political constitutionalism are very different, uh, if they've been said, but in my opinion, they share uh, a so-called uh, rejection for judicial supremacy, surely. Uh, they focus on the uh, parliamentary supremacy and the legitimacy of parliamentary uh, system over legal, over judicial uh, systems. And obviously uh, what uh, divided populist and po political constitutionalists uh, is the, the conception of democracy. Uh, political constitutionalists, like for instance, Richard Bellamy are truly democratic, are truly uh, engaged in uh, um, democracy as, as um, a plural and, and uh, free, um, free space for the liberation and and majority rule. Instead, populist uh, constitutionalism as a, um, can, can have a, an authoritarian and illiberal and also anti-democratic in some sense, in some sense, um, uh, intentions. In political constitutionalism, for instance, I quote Richard Bellamy, for political constitutionalists, the democratic process is the constitution. 
So uh, they, they keep a monistic, to use a, a Kermanian, a Kermanian uh, vocabulary, they, uh, they, keep, they keep a monistic idea of democracy as opposed to the legal dualistic, dualistic idea of democratic uh, lawmaking. And uh, what, but what they, what uh, radically separate political constitutionalism from populism is the role of, and the meaning of the constitution in a democratic system. For political constitutionalists, uh, uh, Richard Bellamy, but also uh, Jeremy Waldron, albeit from a political and not um, a legal perspective, constitution is a necessary component of democratic decision-making. Political constitutionalists devote great attention and a strong commitment to defend fundamental rights, especially minority rights. By contrast, and, and, and political constitutionalists keeps, uh, keep very, very uh, focused on pluralism. Instead, populists are seeing seen the constitution as a mere instrument to preserve power, an instrument that, be, that might be influenced, modified, and often subverted to strengthen the, the leader power and its majority. Uh, in, in, Bellamy, uh, in Bellamy version, uh, political constitutionalism stems from a republican conception of democracy and take the constitution as a defense of majoritarian and representative democracy and parliamentary authority, rather than as a way to merely impose a uh, leadership, uh, such as instead uh, for, for, um, for populist constitutionalism. Uh, I will I will skip because uh, the, the time is is running, and I will focus more in on populist on populist uh, approach to constitutionalism because because uh, what what uh, identifies populist constitutionalism is something that Professor Blocker has has uh, identified as legal skepticism or, or also judicial resentment uh, and intolerance towards judicial role and constitutional constraints that, in my opinion, makes populist constitutionalism the real nemesis of legal constitutionalism rather than political or popular constitutionalism. I will, I will say that uh, populist approach is the real the real foe of any legal or liberal uh, model of constitutionalism. It has been argued, I have argued, that populist constitutionalism and populism in general epitomizes an illiberal model of democracy that follows a radical form of majoritarianism by which democracy is reduced to continuous recall to the will of the majority, confused with the will of the people within every aspect of social life, both political and constitutional. And obviously it clashes with the classical Ackermannian distinction between uh, constitutional, popular uh, lawmaking, supreme lawmaking and, and majoritarian uh, ordinary lawmaking. And to conclude, populist constitutionalism draws four strong arguments against liberal legal constitutionalism. It accuses liberal democracy of depriving the people of their power to directly and freely decide about, decide about the constitution. Thus, legal institutions such as judicial review or uh, the, uh, the courts would violate popular serenity and the will of, of the people, of the real people. Second, representative liberal democracy characterized by institutions such as, such as uh, courts or every institution that might limit the executive branch is viewed with suspicion as a false form of democracy. 
uh, I will I call I my site here uh, the illuminating uh, text uh, by Posner and Vermeul, the executive unbound. I think that in populism there's also these uh, these um, uh, this this interest for the, this this desire for a unbound power uh, executive power. Third point I uh, I think is important to define populist constitutionalism. Uh, populists uh, reject any kind of judicial supremacy or judicial review or legal protection of the constitution. Uh, and I think here it follows the so-called counter-majoritarian difficulty raised by, by Alexander Bikel and uh, re, um, reconsidered by, by Bellamy and Waldron also. Unelected, unelected institutions causes a lack of democratic authorship and accountability that make justices an elitist group rather than a cardinal component of democratic decision-making. Uh, four, populist distrust institutional, supranational or communitarian institutions, which imposes an external influence over the national government. Thus populist, especially right-wing ones, contest European institutions, both political, economical or judicial, since they would dis disregard the will of the nation, national people in the name of the union interest, of the common interest. As Luigi Correas uh, eloquently maintains, populists will always value, I quote, the will of the people above constitutional rules and procedures and will display a general distrust of law and procedures and a critical stance towards an, the undemocratic judiciary. Um, so to conclude, to conclude, uh, if we if we we want to 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 give a, uh, to propose a, a comparison within we, we, between these three anti anti legal constitutionalisms, populist, popular, and political. Uh, obviously, populist constitutionalism appeared the most radical threat, the most radical uh, anti-legal constitutionalism. Uh, and obviously, uh, popular is very, very far from the populist. Um, because popular and populist and political, sorry, have in some sense, anti-judicial, but not illiberal and anti-democratic connotations. And they, uh, their aim is to, uh, to reinforce democratic uh, decision-making through uh, majoritarian, majoritarian institutions rather than legal, but they do not constitute a threat for democratic uh, regime in, uh, in, its, in its roots. Instead, instead, populisms, uh, populists do not, um, um, is a, 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 uh, presents a real, a real problem for, for constitutional democracy uh, because it undermines the, the, um, the proper, the proper uh, rules and the proper um, characteristics of constitutional democracy. Thank you. Sorry for the for the um, for the run, but the time the time was was very very uh, small. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valerio. Uh, uh, now we will proceed to the last presentation. Uh, Haralambos, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Christos. I'm uh, really honored to be, you, to be here with uh, all of you and uh, I will try to share uh, my ideas uh, with you. And I will also try not to repeat uh, some uh, things that uh, have also been uh, indicated, uh, especially by Valerio, but also by other uh, uh, colleagues. 
So the endogenous crisis of uh, political uh, legitimacy over the last decade uh, has opened up uh, the debate uh, on the future of democracy in Europe. The constitutional aspect of this uh, crisis has been described by Michael Wilkinson as a reprise of authoritarian liberalism, re revealing the authoritarian face of economic liberalism, which Hermann Heller identified as characteristic of the late Weimar regime. This uh, framework poses challenges to constitutionalism, a term today used so divergently that it has become associated with almost everything, from the empowerment of citizens to the depoliticization and the universal triumph of liberalism. In this debate, populist constitutionalism, firstly developed as we know in the United States in the early 90s, have moved in the direction of citizen empowerment and posing a challenge to a dominant notion of representative democracy that limits the democratic principle of self-determination to the electoral procedure for the nomination of a legislative organ. But populist constitutionalism is not so radical, according to my point of view, when it comes to what are its own alternatives to the existing representative democracy and how far it wants to deepen the constitutional transformation. My paper focuses on these questions and relates them to the contemporary debate on the future of representative democracy. Now, very briefly, which are the basic beliefs of uh, populist constitutionalism that will help me uh, to uh, present my point? Populist constitutionalism accuses liberal or legal constitutionalism of codifying a purely formalist way of dealing with the constitution and moving towards depoliticization, as Paul Blocker has put it. It, it thus criticizes the dominant view of the rule of law and especially of the increasing role of the courts in the interpretation of the constitution. Taking the constitution away from the courts, to remember the famous uh, formula of Mark Tasnet, not only questions the supremacy of the judges as the uh, experts of constitutional interpretation, it also tries to construct populism as a constitutional category, as I understand it. From this point of view, the populist constitutionalists' uh, argument is connected with the political constitutionalism of Richard Bellamy and Jeremy Waldron. Both put emphasis on political participation and both stress the absence of popular accountability that, that characterizes judicial review. The main aim of populist constitutionalism is to connect or to reconnect constitutionalism with the subject of the constitution the people, uh, conceiving representation as a process of constant political mobilization rather than voting once every four or five years. Thus, Richard Parker, in his famous poly uh, Constitutional Populist Manifesto of 1993, challenges, challenged the conventional discourse about constitutional law, criticizing the idea that constitutional constraints are meant to tame the exertion of popular political energy rather than, as he would wish, to galvanize it. The basis of Parker's argument is that within conventional uh, discourse about constitutional law, there is a difference of sensibility. The anti-populist sensibility conceives ordinary political energy as a problem whereas the populist sensibility conceives its absence as a problem. In this framework, he, articulates his view, he articulated his view on representation. Government must not only be responsible to ordinary people, it must be responsive to them too. This concept determines his understanding of the central mission of, the, of constitutional law. That should be nothing less than to promote majority rule by interpreting the constitution according to the famous formula of Abraham Lincoln, government of the people, by the people, for the people. Uh, I think that a bit of 
uh, more moderate compared to Parker's manifesto is the theory of Jack Balkin. At the heart of Balkin's argument is a framework originalism that treats the constitution as a framework which sets politics in motion and leaves much space for the citizens to fill in through constitutional interpretation, uh, sorry, constitutional constructions. Thus, when citizens do not accept the decision of the courts or the politicians, they exercise their right to claim the constitution as theirs and not as property of those in power. These processes improve the legitimation of the constitution, reaffirming its vitality through the political and social mobilizations that change the constitution in practice. Now, I'll say something about some things about the relation between uh, populist constitutionalism and political populism trying to focus mainly on the, uh, the uh, points that I somewhat uh, differentiated myself from the previous uh, speakers. Some scholars differentiate populist mm -hmm. constitutionalism from political populism by claiming that the former constitutes a theory that tries to enhance the dominant principle without causing damage to the rule of law, but the latter deforms the democratic principle, addressing an essentialist approach of the people and of the majority principle. Political populism in Mood and Kalt Wasser's formula that we all know, comes from both left and right. This is despite the left being inclusionary and the right exclusionary. Right-wing populism is often associated with the far-right nationalist and authoritarian governments of Hungary and uh, Poland, whose constitutional implications have been systematically examined by Bojan Bugeric, that we uh, heard also today morning. Their practices have made uh, Gabor Almay, as I understood it, to doubt whether this is constitutionalism at all, considering the term constitutionalism, uh, constitutional populism as an oxymoron. I said because it's also a Greek word. Uh, these governments, uh, however, do not use this term to describe themselves. This kind of populism, according to Neil Walker, involves a reaction against what it contains as the neglect of the unitary collective particular in the liberal version of, of modern constitutionalism. From this perspective, right-wing populism is associated with Carl Schmitt's critique of pluralism and his definition of the people as a political entity that it is not only within the constitution, but also anterior to and above it. The people for Smith is in fact an organic community. On the other side, left-wing populism has been adopted by some scholars and political forces as a positive term to, to describe their own project. One of the most influential theories of this current is Sandal move that was uh, which was also uh, who was also mentioned before. She argues for revitalization of democracy through the return of the political, which she defines as an agonistic debate between adversaries. Therefore, she tries to use, to use Smith against Smith, replacing enemy with adversary and antagonism with agonism in order to defend liberal democracy against its self-destruction. More specifically, she modifies Smith's notion of uh, the political as a distinction between friend and enemy to argue that demo democracy requires the recognition of an adversary, of the they, in order to construct the people, the we, in, uh, <clears throat> uh, avoiding the liberal inclination towards abstract universalism. However, she rejects the transcendence of antagonism as impossible, and she associates this perspective, calling it myth of communism, with a blueprint for a final destination and the creation of a transparent and reconciled society. According to her agonistic 
uh, approach to democracy, it is possible to reject the hegemony of the, pre of the present neoliberal order while retaining and extending liberal democratic values and constitutions. Consequently, the centrist attack to move is deliberately exaggerated, uh, exaggerated according to my point of view, trying to drive from the contemporary political agenda, not only revolutionary projects, but also radical democratic ones. The above analysis shows that the demands of left political populism and of populist popular or political uh, uh, constitutionalism have common reference points. They share an interest in the improvement of democracy's quality, they seek ways to enhance popular participation, and they accept the basic institutional formation of liberal democracy. They both also have a common nucleus, and that is the readmission of the people into the picture and the recognition of politics in a democracy as a constant perturbing argument. This focus on the people is the source of both their, strength, their strengths and weaknesses. The, the stress of popular political energy is vital for anyone who wants to invigorate democracy and reverse the tendency of the markets and the supranational organizations to diminish the potential of the democratically legitimized representative body to decide on alternative policies. The crucial question remains, however, how will the government be systematically responsive to ordinary people according to Parker's formula? Here, populist constitutionalism and also political populism seem unable to give an account of the materially configured everyday life that limits who can participate actively in politics. But as Rakran's here has stated, representative democracies determine in advance the appropriate ways of being, doing, and saying. Therefore, it is essential to return to Marx's critique of liberal democracy as a form that treats citizens as if equally sovereign in the political realm, while their contingent social existence constantly betrays this universality. Marx pointed out that mere political democracy sustains the separation between the political community, the abstractly abstractly equal political community and the private community of economic interests in civil society where inequality reigns. This description is not of course equal, <coughs> equivalent to the dismissal of liberal democracy as a mere facade where replacement, whose replacement by an openly authoritarian regime should be a matter of indifference. On the contrary, Marx anticipates moves constructivist turn, but with a twist. He gives an account of the people and of the whole system of political representation as constituted by socioeconomic conditions. Thus, populist constitutionalism's critique of key feature of con uh, features of contemporary Western uh, uh, polities, such as passive citizenry, the displacement, the displacement of parliamentary institutions by unelected centers of power and structural constraints, constraints towards any radical changes to uh, neoliberal rule risks being abstract if it does not thematize the entanglement between liberal democracy and bourgeois hegemony. To sum up, populist constitutionalism challenges powerfully the procedural accounts that seem to be dri uh, driven by instrumentalist reasoning. It reminds us of the fact that constitutions reflect or have to reflect the will of people in their sovereign capacity, and it is precisely 
for this reason that they can limit and control government. However, although it acknowledges the omnipresence of conflicting social and political interests, populist constitutionalism seems to underestimate the extent to which the representative democracy is skewed by the terms on which wealth and property are structured and maintained. That is why I propose to recall and critically vindicate, vindicate the Marxist critique. It underlines the historical progress represented in the official recognition of political equality, but it insists that it, that, that is impaired by the whole framework of capitalist society. Populist constitutionalism, criticism of the anti-democratic tendencies of liberal or legal constitutionalism is justified. It would be better to deepen it by focusing on how democracy has been deprived of its social content rather than to continue equating democracy with the special forms of liberal democracy that we know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Haralabos. Uh, there is a quarter of an hour for questions. And uh, now let's proceed uh, with uh, anybody who wants to raise a question uh, about uh, the four preceding uh, presentations. Uh, yes, I can see one. Fortis, uh, you can raise your, your question. Thank you, first of all, and thank you everyone for an extremely interesting panel. Now, my question, so unfortunately, Bobby says it usually happens preempted me. So we might be accused from, you know, plagiarizing each other. But my question sort of is both to Paul Blocker and to Valerio Fabrizzi, congrats both of you. And Paul, your, your presentation was anything but confusing. You should see my notes. Um, so my question is, so it seems to me that even framing the, the problem as populist might be problematic in its own right, right? So given, you know, the categorization, the taxonomies you went through, I wanted you to press on the point that sort of Babis actually touched upon, the uh, Mike Wilkinson's idea of authoritarian liberalism. So it might be convenient to frame uh, anything that is antithetical to contemporary established politics or constitutional regimes as populist and set it aside, which leads me to, to Valeria's presentation and the importance of political constitutionalism. And the same question goes to you within that context. So political constitutionalism is by definition pluralist. It allows debate and discuss beyond any delimitations or formal terminological constraints, if you will. So again, I would like you to sort of discuss whether or not focusing on political constitutionalism or the synergy of political constitutionalism and legal constitutionalism would be a way of sort of circumventing this obsession with populism in recent years, which if I may, is not too dissimilar from you know, an EU law scholar's point of view with the obsession of Euroscepticism in previous years. So effectively, we're using terms just to create enemies and set them aside and thus delimit the very popular and constitutional discourse in the end of the day. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Uh, I can see now that uh, Boyan wishes to raise a question also. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just a, a quick question for Paul and a quick question uh, for Valerio. So for Paul, um, th I, I really enjoyed your presentation. And I have a, a question about your mac mapping of this uh, conservative Christian version of populism. And uh, um, I, think it, I think that you got the basic story right. I wonder if there is a room also within this movement, you know, for a greater variety, variety of options, which would then lead to a rather more um, provisional characterization of the key elements of these parts. So for example, I'm thinking, I'm sure you're aware of the, you know, Rogers Brubaker, you know, he coined this, you know, version of liberal illiberalism. So he points to, you know, 
important differences between illiberals in you know Eastern and Central Europe and illiberals in in Western Europe. You know, including you know one from your own country and many others who have a quite different, distinctive attitudes to you know legal constitutionalism and other forms. That's one. And number two. Um, I find your um, general approach and, you know, the, the you know, uh, you're following Jan Werner Müller's, you know, point about, you know, constraining democracy, very useful and very helpful. I just have a small tiny problem with your, when you get to the explanation, and I think I already told you this point, you're, I think you, you know, you, you really um, emphasize, you put a lot of emphasis on the importance of, you know, legal constitutionalism, you know, and, and you ascribed to me at least, you know, too much to, I mean, uh, do you do you have like an empirical examples which would show that, you know, these large conservative, you know, populist movements are what really makes them, you know, you know, angry are, you know, like, uh, you know, legal institutions, legal forms. I mean, of course, they are part of the problem, but don't you think that, you know, putting too much weight on that element uh, neglects uh, other elements which should also come into the calculation? And then for Valerio, um, I found your um, approach uh, interesting, but um, I think there are two stories that are going on in your in your in your in your narrative. And one is a attempt to describe the relationship between populist constitutional populism and constitutionalism, and the other one is the relationship between uh, legal and political constitutionalism. And although there is an overlap between the two. Um, uh, there is no, you know, precise one-to-one -one match. You know, populism is much broader. You know, it's not exhausted. You know, this is a very, the debate between legal and political is a very, you know, British-American debate. You know, about judicial review between Mark Tushnet and Richard Bellamy and Jeremy Waldron and others. Whereas populism includes, you know, so many other things. So, so, so when you, then in the end, for example, you you ended up with a quite, you know, broad, uh, strong statements, basically saying that. Populism, you know, as such, is you know sort of in, you know, you know inherently you know antithetical you know to legalism and, and, and constitutionalism. Can you point to me to the co concrete examples? You know, when you support this thesis, for example, I'm, I have in mind, for example, one very interesting work, and I see that uh, Lucia is also in the audience here. For example, she wrote a piece about uh, Cinque Stelle in Italy, and actually she shows that you know. It's very hard to, you know, ascribe to Cinque Stelle this kind of, you know, anti-constitutional. Actually, she argues the opposite, and I do the same in my book with Tashnet. So I think uh, mm -hmm. uh, distinguishing this between two strands would help you actually a little bit to get the picture sort of more more accurate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is a, one more question uh, written in chat. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's a question raised by Petrus Tadimidis. Is there any distinction between American and European populist constitutionalism? Uh, Christo, uh, Lucia Cos also raised uh, her hand. Uh, I, haven't seen her. I haven't seen her. Uh, okay. Lucia? Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this uh, session has been terrific. So, my question is uh, for all. And exactly the point that Bojan just touched. How do we square, uh, we square in this picture of populism as a kind of extreme repolitization of uh, constitutional issues with the anti-political aspect of populism? Because I think that populism is for sure an appeal to the people, but it is also um, uh, a very anti-elitist um, uh, kind of political ideology where politics itself seems to raise the suspicion of corruption, etc., etc. For instance, I, I studied the Five Star Movement and yes, they are not anti-constitutional in the sense that we said, that they, but, but they may raise other constitutional concerns because they want basically to reduce the powers of the parliament and give more power to the citizens outside political institutions. So my question is this, uh, how to square the anti-political dimension of populism with this idea, which is recurrent, of populism as a reaction to legal constitutions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Akrita, is there any other question? 
Uh, no, not not from me. Uh, I, I see now uh, Gokan. Uh, as okay. Okay. Let's proceed, Gokan. No, I'm, uh, I, I'm just trying to unmute, but uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, uh, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much again. Yeah, um, I just want to ask, I still cannot change my mind uh, from thinking that there is one single populism which includes at the same time leftist or rightist or authoritarian or liberal. Uh, turning back to Paul's division of populist constitutionalism, normal, and populist constitutionalism too, um, isn't there any uh, permeability between these two? For example, in uh, Hungary and in Turkey and in, in authoritarian constitutionalism, there is always a, a sort of rhetoric of constituent power. There is a constant constituent power going on. And um, not only there are traditions always invoked, but there's always revolution on the, on the electoral boots or on, on ongoing revolution or ongoing national, uh, national um, quest for some sort of uh, enlightenment, etc. There's always this rhetoric is existent. Uh, in, in, in both of these constitutionalisms. Also this, um, um, this internationalism uh, component uh, is also valid for, uh, not in the sense of the people, but in the sense of the ally between the populist leaders. Uh, and Hungary looks up to Turkey, but Turkey was once uh, against this local tradition because it was the Ottoman Empire who really uh, humiliated Hungarian national identity once, but uh, in contrary to that, Hungary really, uh, you know, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't condescend to Turkey, but looks up to Turkey as a form of example to Erdogan's Turkey. So this is sort of things, this uh, classification is perfect for me, but uh, I, uh, I stop somewhere when I uh, continue writing or thinking uh, where to put uh, which case to what. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are no other questions, let's proceed to uh, the responses. Uh, but let me see. Uh, I would like to be. Okay. There's one more question written in the chat. Uh, if you, um, uh, it's a question addressed uh, to Paul Broker. Would you think that the middle ground between the mastery and the autonomy forms that you have identified can be found in a more formalized deliberative process? In this connection, would you think that President Macron's initiative of ongoing, uh, uh, of ongoing deliberative debates between randomly selected citizens that has been going on for some years now is a step in the right direction? I think that this was the final question. So I think that uh, we can proceed to the responses. So let's go on. So uh, who, who is uh, supposed to respond now? The last question is by Andreas Samar. I cannot see his name written properly. And his question is, uh, would you think that the middle ground between the mastery and the autonomy forms that you have, that you have identified can be found in a more formalized deliberative process? In this connection, would you think that President Macron's initiative of ongoing deliberative debates between randomly selected citizens that have been going on for some years is a step in the right direction. That was the last question. Paul, Paul Blocker. Yeah, Paul Blocker. It wasn't clear to me because we're four panelists, right? <laughs> so uh, I wondered wh whether you want to have the order of the presentations. I realized there were quite some uh, questions that refer to my presentation. I will start with uh, Fotis and uh, his, 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 his very good question, of course, is do we really need to uh, frame this stuff, uh, all this stuff, all these very different manifestations of, of politics, et cetera, as populism? Um, and I think it's a good question. It haunts me basically all the time um, because it seems to me that uh, um, indeed, like in the cases of Hungary and Poland, 
one might in some cases doubt that populism is really a useful uh, 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 label. And that's why I almost always I suppose add things like a right wing or conservative to uh, the mix. Um, but that also, I mean, for me, it's it's really uh, the, the the proof is in the pudding. That is, um, when it proves to be useful, when it can be used to compare, for instance, different phenomena. Uh, I think it it, it may uh, be helpful. And so, in a very simple uh, way of, of of distinguishing things, it seems to me that populism comes to the fore in some kind of binary view. Um, that is uh, juxtaposing society to political institutions, etc. most of the times, um, but also in its promise of democratization. And there, I still think that Hungary and Poland are part of the story. And so there are claims by uh, the governments, etc., that they are actually realizing something alternative, but which still needs the label of democracy, like Orban's illiberal democracy or whatever. Um, and that also, um, that brings me immediately to Boyan's remarks um, about uh, further options, uh, further manifestations of populism, um, which I, I'm not necessarily against, although in my view, like uh, uh, Brubaker's liberal liberalism, um, that might be a different uh, um, way in which populism manifests itself. And I, I suppose even Le Pen in certain ways might fit that label. But in my own research, I, I, um, I think I fleshed out very important affinities between uh, Wilders, Baudet, Le Pen, uh, Salvini, uh, Kaczynski, and Orban. And so um, that's still, uh, there's still clear uh, uh, linkages there. Uh, and that, that brings me also to uh, your question about uh, Boyan, about um, 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 how um, important is actually that legal constitutional dimension? And I simply, I can simply respond by it's hyper important. It's extremely important, I think. Also because in my view, and I, I, I uh, in certain ways I borrowed this from Andrew Arato, who I think is really one of the most insightful scholars around on populism. Um, there is clearly in populism a dimension that ought to be upfront for all of us, that is, it is constitution, constituent. There is a dimension in populist claims, even if they're not directly legalistic, uh, that refers to constituent power, uh, either by operating in a way as if existing rules don't uh, uh, matter, that's a constituent critique in a very pro profound sense, uh, but also, and I think I show that in my work, by in many different ways, referring to legal, constitutional dimensions, human rights dimensions, etc., um, and so it seems to me extremely uh, uh, important to keep that dimension uh, in the mix, and in some cases, actually put it into a kind of set of criteria that I think are are crucial there. Um, and that brings me to Lucia's uh, remarks. Uh, really interesting, uh, but also. Um, particularly if we start talking about the Five Star Movement, uh, things become complicated. I mean, um, as I said to my student yesterday, in 2012, I think it was, Grillo organized a Vaffanculo Day, a Vaffa Day, against the Italian 1948 Constitution. The year after, his parliamentarians uh, 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 occupied the roof of the Italian Parliament, protesting in favor of the Italian 1948 constitution. And so there's a, there's a peculiar uh, set of perspectives there uh, harbored within one movement. Um, I fully agree with um, the di dimension that, that uh, Lucia puts into the mix, that is the anti-politics, uh, the dimension of uh, um, uh, a kind of depoliticizing de movement within many manifestations of uh, uh, populism, but I think at the same time, uh, there is clearly uh, the opposite movement. That is, in some movements, the clear uh, motives of uh, being a political movement is by trying to enhance options for politics. Um, for instance, and there, uh, Moves' work is again interesting. Uh, in many ways, she, she criticizes 
liberalism for stifling politics, wanting to put uh, uh, exactly uh, agonism, uh, referring back to her older work with Laclau, back into the heart uh, of politics. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't uh, eat up too much of our time. Uh, um, there's the uh, remark on the permeal permeability between uh, what I call populist constitutionalism one and two. Um, I agree, uh, but there's also, I, I mean, of course I use these as a kind of Weberian ideal types. Um, of course, in reality, we will see um, mixes of this position. That's I, also why I put internationalism, I put inter between brackets, because some uh, left-wing populists are clearly against international institutions. Others are actually riding the waves of international institutions. And that brings me to my really final remark um, about the, the, the question in the chat. Yes, I think we also ought to think about democratic populist constitutionalism as some kind of solution, as some kind of answer to the critique on a, high, a too legalistic, a too formalistic type of uh, constitutionalism. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, I can see that uh, Gabor has raised uh, his hand. I don't know if he wishes to raise a question or to respond or both. Uh, so, Gabor. So, uh, if I if I make some some very quick points. Uh, partly reacting to, to the questions. Uh, first, uh, a follow-up to, to Paul's reaction to, to Lucia's question regarding anti-politics. Although I'm not an expert in Italian populism, but one, one counter-argument to this anti-politics uh, uh, claim is the, the, the practice of the Cinque Stelle governments which is not, not so much willing to, to, to give the people the power, but so much more uh, strengthening the power of the government, which is certainly not something uh, considered as anti-politics. The second point is, is reaction to Kokan's uh, uh, question about uh, populist sovereignty used by, by certain authoritarian populists like uh, Viktor Orban. So one, one uh, real proof that this is nothing but uh, a rhetoric was that when, when, the, when the Hungarian parliament of, of the newly elected Fidesz party uh, enacted a new constitution, they were reluctant to put it into a referendum, which was proposed by the that time uh, and current opposition. Uh, uh, and my very last point, it's probably unrelated to, to concrete questions addressed to, to uh, me or, or other panelists. It's about, about populism as a kind of critique to, to uh, liberal democracy or liberalism altogether. I agree with, with that point, but on the other hand, I should say that that liberalism is, is not just the, the original liberalism of, of limiting, limiting government. If we take into account uh, John Rawls's approach, so one of the key elements of, of Rawls' theory of justice is to fight against the, the income inequality, inequality, which is very much a demand of, of populism. So in other words, if we reinterpret uh, liberalism in a way uh, dealing with, with income inequality as well, and also adding liberalism, certain elements of, of, of Republican aspects. Uh, so I consider uh, Michael Sandel as a, as a liberal uh, 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 Republican, so to say, emphasizing the, the not only the, the, the fight of liberalism against interference, but also against domination. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Valerio, Babis, uh, would you like to add something to respond to... Uh, I just, I'm just going to respond to the precious and wonderful questions 
my uh, the colleagues uh, has ra has raised uh, very very demanding very very um, interesting questions and uh, thanks to them because they they helped me to to point out some something that uh, is is uh, has been left on on the shadow during my during my uh, my speech uh, I will be very brief but I uh, I hope to be exhaustive. The first question uh, was about uh, political constitutionalism. Yeah, sure. I think political constitutionalism is completely uh, a different uh, approach rather than uh, populist. Uh, political constitutionalism has a, uh, a theoretical ground, th theoretical, theoretical uh, uh, presupposes. Um, and uh, the fact that they defend uh, rights, they they defend the, their defense of of political uh, pluralism uh, and the, the reasonable disagreement and the liberation and the republican right to participate. Obviously, um, my my um, comparison, my comparison between political and, and other forms of uh, unlegal, anti-legal constitutionalisms, for instance, populist, limits to their um, uh, rejection or uh, strong doubts about, uh, about towards, towards legal, uh, legal judicial review and, and judicial supremacy. And this is the only the only one uh, point in common between uh, a, a populist approach to constitutionalism and a, pop, uh, and a political one. And I think that political is more close to to, uh, to popular, uh, also with with different shades and different and different uh, and different points. Uh, the second, uh, the second uh, question, Boyan Bugaric. Thank you very much, because uh, your points are very, very important in my in my discussion. Uh, I start with legal and political constitutionalisms. Obviously, this opens uh, completely an another another uh, another universe and something that I have I have studied more deeply in my doctoral st studies and uh, obviously uh, th this discussion about populism is not so um, uh, in uh, deep in the in the in this in this discussion obviously the literature as you said literature between uh, a, um, legal and political constitutionalism is quite is quite immense and uh, it deserves another another uh, another panel and my, my my only point here, recalling recalling legal such as uh, Rawls or, or Ackerman or others, uh, has been aimed to um, to propose the the counterpart of 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 anti judicial anti judicial uh, positions. Uh, rather, the, the second point you you raised, populism and constitutionalism. Anti-constitutionalism. Yeah, um, I, I join here in responding this point, and I'm going to join uh, Lucia Lucia's point about anti-political. Uh, yeah, populism is not. Uh, uh, how can I say? It's not anti-constitutional by rule. Uh, probably there are there are examples of populism. Or uh, pseudo-populist forces that are not anti-constitutional. I think that Podemos in Spain is not anti-constitutional, or Syriza, or, or uh, Sanders, but they they aim to enforce the constitution, the substantial ground of the constitution, as uh, Professor Luigi Ferraioli would have said, the the idea of social rights, welfare state. The substantial, the substantial dimension of democracy, and probably these are uh, this is a uh, 
um, their uh, constitutional constitutional interests. Obviously, I think there are also examples of anti-constitutional or unliberal uh, forms of populism. For example, uh, Orban reforms in constitutional reforms in Hungary, or the or um, or some forms of of authoritarian uh, decision making in uh, in other in other contexts. Um, about five star movements, I think we have to say we have to make a distinction between a first phase, first uh, first east, first part of. Uh, five stars movement history and a second one. In its beginning, its origin, I think that five star movements uh, had uh, uh, some controversial and surely anti political uh, approaches when they said we will open the parliamentary as a, as a um, tuna uh, box. And I think that this is a a very anti-political and quite and quite uh, serious uh, declaration against parliamentary uh, legitimation. But if you if we see five tough movements today, we cannot deny that they have been be, uh, be, become a, a, a perfectly uh, parliamentary force. Uh, Di Maio Di Maio has said recently that. The movement is now a, a liberal liberal party, a modern and European liberal party. So, if we distinguish between a, an original, an original uh, uh, fight of movements, I, th I think yes, they have been. They were they were anti political, and maybe in some declarations, also a bit uh, controversial on. On the constitutional matters, uh, uh, five staff movements, and today uh, going in with uh, Lega in the first moment, the moment with the Democratic Party and uh, with with Conte, and now with uh, Draghi. Draghi is the 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 champion of the European power, and now is the 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 premier, that uh, the prime minister in a uh, in a government government in which the movements is is strongly present within the major majority. So uh, I think, and I, con I conclude, the movement, the Five Star Movements is one of the most complicated example of populism because they, they, they are uh, so um, multivariate in, this, in these years. And now if, uh, if, uh, if some, someone that who never uh, knew uh, something about the movements would say that they are a, a traditional party, traditional party in the in the democratic in the democratic legislation. Uh, but the history uh, teaches us that they have been never uh, the same in the past. Thank you, thank you very much for for your uh, for your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Babis would like to add something. Uh, please take into account that we are uh, 15 uh, minutes over our schedule. Uh, yes, I take account of this and thank you very much. Uh, just uh, two points. Uh, the first uh, small point is that uh, uh, I am for the abandonment of even the term populist for the authoritarian governments and movements. And uh, I want to present uh, just uh, two uh, examples of the, uh, of, the, of the public debate in Greece, uh, because I think that the only, uh, uh, the, I think that uh, there is an open instrumentalization of the term by the liberals. And in Greece, it is uh, it's very obvious. Uh, the first one is that we have seen the, the coup d'etat of the Trump supporters in uh, the United States. Uh, there were, uh, we have seen in our uh, TVs and in the internet, uh, supporters of Trump 
wearing t-shirts with Auschwitz and the liberal uh, papers were posting these uh, 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 these uh, photos saying that look these populists the the, the guys with the Auschwitz t-shirts and the second one is that uh, uh, two years ago the newly the newly elected uh, uh, liberal uh, right-wing government here in, uh, in Greece, the, sorry, the Minister of Education of this government said in a national, uh, uh, in an occasion, I, I, I'm not sure about the occasion, but uh, she said explicitly that uh, uh, we, in, uh, during the 40s, uh, we in Greece, we have uh, defeated populism and uh, saying that Mussolini is what's called populism. So uh, I am for the abandonment of the, of the term. I think that uh, it's, uh, uh, it has only to do with the mere instrumentalization by the, by the liberals. Uh, as for uh, what uh, Lucia Corso has, uh, has stated, I think that uh, we have to distinguish the anti-political uh, from what uh, I could call politics from below. It's, uh, there are two different uh, things. Uh, to when uh, people demonstrate, when they, uh, when there is popular initiative, and uh, when there are referendums, where, whether there is uh, that popular energy that uh, Parker has uh, has mentioned, uh, I think that this is uh, uh, this is political. Uh, the, we, we should not uh, say that political is only what it has to do with the formal political uh, institutions. And uh, finally, uh, just uh, another uh, uh, terminology uh, observation. Uh, I think that even uh, with uh, uh, even referring to internationalism is uh, uh, for left-wing uh, populism is uh, has to be uh, concrete. Uh, we have to not use the terms in the way they are determined by the dominant uh, visions. Uh, for example, when there was the confrontation uh, in 2015 uh, here in Greece, the, the one that uh, Bojan Bugaric has uh, uh, reminded us of, uh, here in Greece there was uh, an uh, 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 the, the left was, co uh, was uh, uh, calling to, to a, a confrontation with uh, the uh, international organizations uh, in terms of addressing to the people of abroad, of, uh, uh, of the other nations, to the people of Europe, to, to revolt uh, against uh, their governments, the austerity and all this thing. And even the left's criticism to Syriza uh, capitulation to, to austerity was uh, that uh, instead of uh, signing a new memorandum, it should have uh, uh, addressed, uh, 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 it should have make, uh, made a confrontation and addressed to the people of Europe uh, and uh, to, to press the, the European elites. Uh, whatever we think uh, politically about it, uh, uh, it's not uh, internationalism, only the, the European Union. It's also, I say it, and this is my last word, uh, word as, a, as a veteran of the movement of uh, Genoa and Florence, when we went uh, there to demonstrate in 2001 and 2002 and uh, 2004, then in the European and World Social Forums, we went in order to say that uh, 
it is uh, the workers or the people that should uh, be against the, uh, the elites that uh, uh, determine the life of uh, the ordinary people and also that run the, Euro the international organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your attention and participation for uh, in this uh, vivid uh, conversation. And uh, now I think that uh, we have to skip to our uh, next session. Thank you very much again.